Okay. 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 Okay.
and be with those who were mentioned here this morning that they may have the strength and the comfort and the healing that, that they need and be with the families of those who lost loved ones that really need extra strength right now. We'd ask that you be with Mark when he brings the message this morning and watch over and guide us in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Turn, we got one more before Mark comes up here. Turn to the very front of your book. 10,000 angels. Okay, these girls love this one. So we're going to sing three verses, verses 1, 2, and 4. Actually, let's change that. 1, 3, and 4. Let's do 1, 3, and 4. 10,000 angels in the front of your hymn book. <laughs>
forget your Bible. Oh, neglect your Bible, forget to pray. That's the word, ready? <laughs> neglect your Bible, forget to pray. Ah, oh, forget to pray, forget to pray. Neglect your Bible, forget to pray. And you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. And you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. Neglect your Bible, pray every day, and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. But nobody wants to stay down here, do they? So let's sing it fast and let's grow. Ready? Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. Don't leave room for growing and you'll grow, grow. Jesus is the Son of God. 
Uh, and this whole idea of winning, of being victorious, maybe your Bible uses the words uh, overcome, uh, and maybe your translations through that part, through the last part, says victory or conquerors. Whoever has conquered the world, whoever has uh, beaten the world. And it's not the idea here, the idea is that of a battle. It's not the idea of just outlasting, of just out making it through and being beat down and being the last one to stand, and that's what makes you a winner. No, 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 no. Don't misunderstand. It's just in the word that is used in the NIV when it says overcome. It's an idea uh, of, of victory, uh, a winning over the opponents. Uh, it's a reminder that is real that there is a real conflict going on. What does it mean to have victory over the world? What does it mean to overcome? What does it mean to be a conqueror uh, of the world? It's a good reminder as we get every week. That the world that we live in is a spiritual world. Uh, that with it, there is the idea that God tells us to put on the armor of God. There's an unseen war between good and evil, between God and the devil. And the vices that are thrown out there, we talk during prayer times of the difficulties that happen. And the whole reason that we pray is because there's a battle happening. And we need to empower God to be with us, in us, through us, to see his presence moving in our life and to thwart the actions of the enemy, of the devil, and those that are going on. And so when John writes these words, he's saying, you are a victor. You are an overcomer. You have already won this battle. And we're reminded of the different enemies uh, throughout the book of John that we fight. Uh, remember Back in the second chapter of 1 John, it talked about sin, and it talked about don't love the things of the world or anyone, anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not him. For the things of the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting for what he has done, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those are the battles that we face. The, it, our enemy is the world. Our enemy is the flesh. Our enemy is the devil. And John reminds us in these words to inform us that God has won this fight for us. Everything that you need for a victory has already been established for your life. That's why we pray. That's why we worship. So, what I want to spend a little bit of time with today is real simply this. How do you win? How do you know you win? John writes these things. And he, we'll talk about that in another one couple of weeks, so that you will know that you have eternal life, that you can be confident of your victory, uh, that when the enemy comes uh, to knock you down, that you can be reminded, no, 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 I have confidence because of Jesus Christ, because of who he is. In this uh, part of scripture, he tells us two things that it takes to win. You have to have the right family, and you have to join the family in faith. Family matters, right? Do you have the right name? Uh, sometimes uh, as you grow up in a small town, uh, that discussion comes up, doesn't it? Uh, am I, do I have a part of the right family? Uh, do I have the right name uh, to get uh, the spot on the sports team? Uh, the right name to get recognition uh, with, in the news? The right name or the wrong name uh, to be talked about in, in gossip and that way? And my dad always stood up for the children's home kid. And he was a big deal for him when we have a boy from the children's home who could play sports. And he was decent enough that he, dad knew that he could play. But as a person who's a part of a children's home, you don't always have the right name. And that was uh, a, 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 vouch, a strong supporter of those to go to the coach and say, why isn't this guy playing? <laughs> he may not have the right name, but he's good enough to play because dad could see it in him and he knew that he would have to work hard to get the kid the exposure that he needs. What wins? To be a part of the family of God. It's good to be a loser at her. Benny shared in uh, the uh, prayer time this morning, uh, family growing. I don't know what to make of that situation. Uh, am I getting engaged? Uh, she said having another son. I'm not sure what all that means. Uh, we may have to have some arguments uh, about the way that that all comes down the line in that way. And sometimes I wonder, lose at her, what a good name. You know, you tell yourself that when you look in the mirror. But I wonder what the word on the street is about the loose adders. Uh, you know, when, when that name comes up, if it's used in different ways uh, to describe different situations. I don't know what it means to have the name necessarily of a loose adder. But the Bible says we do know what it means to have the name of Christian. 
if you have your Bibles, we're reminded that we are fathered by God, that we are born of God. But the first two, uh, several, uh, the first couple of verses in what we read, in fact, uh, in this little section uh, of chapter 5, it talks about being born of God five times, twice in the first verse, once in verse 4, uh, and twice again in verse 18. Uh, and the idea is that we have been born of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves his father loves his child uh, as well. Uh, in verse 4, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Uh, down to verse 18, something that we didn't read today, but it says this. We know that anyone born of God does not continue in sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Uh, and other versions use the term uh, that's on the screen, to be fathered by God, to have God as your heavenly Father. The whole idea is that God chooses us to bring us into his family. Like a dad standing up for his kids, he provides for us. Uh, he goes out of his way to protect us. Uh, he wants to be uh, the person who stands up and, and makes sure that we are okay doing the things that we have to do, as every good father would do. And the neat idea about this is as we look at the different credentials that are mentioned there, this is a big test for being a Christian. Everyone's a Christian who what does what? Believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We know that. That's what we say in our confession time. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's an important part of your faith. But the amazing part of it, within this very framework, in the same text that is being used there, he also calls you his child. He said, you have to believe that Jesus is God's son, and you are also my children. That doesn't mean that we are on the same level of Jesus Christ, except in God's heart. That God loves us so much that he has put us there, that we are his children, that we are born of God. He calls us into his family. Remember chapter 4, verse 1, one of those big verses that we talked about that you need to put in your heart and memorize. Uh, dear friends, uh, oh, that's not the right one. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. How great the love of the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Take that in your heart and be reminded that you are a child of God if you are born of God through your faith. That leads us back to the story of Jesus and Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus was the Pharisee who had heard all the rumblings about who Jesus was, and he wanted to know, he wanted to see, he wanted to know if it was true or not. And he goes in the middle of the night, because he was a Pharisee, he didn't want to be called out talking to Jesus, and they have this conversation in John chapter 3, surrounding which is John 3.16. Big verse, God so loved the world. It comes right out within that. And in that discussion at the very beginning, they have this interaction here in John chapter 3, verse 3. It says this, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. No one can perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. You have to be born of God. You have to be a part of God's family. Uh, to be fathered by God. To be a part uh, of uh, his uh, protection uh, and, and the, what he does to provide for us. It says several times here in Scripture what we've read. To be born of God means that you believe that Jesus is God's Son. That's the first step. I believe that Jesus... It's got some, not just a person from history, not just a nice guy, not just a good teacher, uh, not just the ideal uh, that someone has created a long time ago to help everybody live good. No, no, no. Jesus is the Son of God. And as you believe that Jesus is God's Son, through faith, you're born again. You're fathered by God. You're invited into his family. It also says we are born of God if we keep his commands. A child of God obeys God. Real simple. To be born of God, to be a part of God's family, is to do what God asks you to do, including this verse uh, that 
alludes to a little bit and what we talked about so much last week, loving other people. One of the biggest uh, examples that you can show in your life that you are God's child is if you love other people. It says it several times very plainly. If you don't love other people, you're not a child of God. It's a litmus test. It's a figuring out of who you are, uh, whether you're with God or not. The last thing it says to be uh, born of God is someone who is, does not sin, who does not live in a lifestyle of sin. There's a lot of people fooling themselves. They want to wear the name Christian and live a life of sin. They want to, to call themselves a part of God's family and take advantage of the promises that God wants to give to them, but all the while holding back in their own decisions, in their own sins, and in their own rebellion. And God says that's not how you're born of God. That does not work that way. It talks very clearly here in this passage the importance of loving other people. The way that we treat other people is a reminder of the way that God loved us. God loves us so that we can love others. That connection is what we say is what makes it important. How can we love other people? Well, we can love other people because we're members of the same family. What ties us together? Not language. Not social position, not time period, not niceness, not our personalities. We're tied together because we have the same father, because we have the same daddy, because we have the same person, the same uh, victor who takes care of us in our faith. That's what makes it easier to love other people. You love other people because God is your dad, and God is their dad too, as they are in faith. Jesus Christ. That's what makes our love for one another easier. It's like uh, it's like once a year when you eat a meal with strange folk. Hey, that's what a reunion is, right? Uh, when you when you all get together and you sit down and you talk and you go over things and you look at all the people at the place and like, boy, I'm glad I'm not related. Yes, you are related to them. Uh, sometimes more direct than you would ever imagine. And the interesting part about being God's family is that you're going to be with those people for eternity. <laughs> Just think about it that way, if you would or not. That, that's what it means to love other people because you have the same, you're a part of the same family. And some of you still have that problem. God, I struggle to forgive. I don't like that person. I don't want to be around those people. Jesus would say to you, too bad. You have to. What's the old adage? Try it. You'll like it. You got to eat it anyway. Uh, I told the story several times of growing up at the children's home. Uh, we had a lot of food given to us. And mom was a great cook. She provided for lots of kids, lots of meals every day. I was amazed that she could even do that. But we had a rule. Had a million rules. But the two of them, well, the two of them I want to highlight at dinner time was very simple. Take a spoonful of everything and clean everything on your plate. Uh, what if I don't like Take a spoonful of everything and clean everything on your plate. Well, but I like the green beans if they have bacon. Take a spoonful of everything and go, what about beets? So take a spoonful. What about clams? Oh, yeah, every now and again they got the weird things thrown at us that people would give to the children's home because it's the children's home and who else is going to use uh, that can of uh, sweet potatoes uh, in that way? Well, that's sweet potatoes. But you did it because that was a rule to do it. Some of you think that you're making your own rules. God says, love other people. But I, I don't make excuses. Love other people. I love to use the illustration of my kids. You know, sometimes we live in such a society that we think we are so pampered, right? Uh, when you go through and you get a meal and you're like, oh, what kind of sauce do you want for your meat? What kind of barbecue sauce do you want? You, you like uh, this one or that one or, you know, everyone has their own sauce that they really, back when I grew up, you got barbecue sauce. Do you want barbecue sauce or do you want no barbecue sauce? Well, I like the one that, you no, want you want it or not? Real simple. You don't get to choose. And the same way is sometimes it is with following God. We want to put it upon our own pride and put it upon our own ideas and put it upon our own souls. And God says, no, no, no. I'm the God. I'm the dad. I'm the father. I set the rules. You follow them. That means I forgive you so that you can forgive other people. We're all a part of the same family, and it's a reminder that what it means to be born of God is to love those people around us. And the other thing it says here in verse, uh, verse 3, 
The last part of verse 3, pay attention to that if you still have your Bibles open. This is love for God to obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. Wait a minute, God. <laughs> you mean that it's not hard to follow you even when I don't want to? Even when I don't like to? Even when I... We throw all kind of opposition in following God, and God reminds us, no, 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 you're looking at it wrong. My commands to you are not a burden for you. They're a blessing for you. If you just walk in faith and do what I say, it will work itself out. I know sometimes you may not like it, but I got a better plan for you in that way. That is a reminder that we, what we do in our response to God is that as we are loved by God, we love Him back. Yeah, the illustration of a young man who is typing manuscripts for a lady author. Uh, as he does all the reading and uh, puts all of the words down on paper, he falls in love with the way that she is able to express herself, and, and he becomes married. Now it's the, his, they become married. Uh, it, his work then doesn't become a labor. He does it because he loves the one who is writing down the words. That's what happens to us when the Bible says, don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It's not a duty for us to follow. It becomes the desire of our heart to not take his name in vain. It becomes something that we want to do because we want to please God, our Father. Several times in Scripture, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and the teachers of the law because they made their religion burdensome. You have to do this. You can't do this. You have to go here. You can't go here. And so he fought that time and time again. Jesus came to teach us that through this new birth to be born of God, it becomes a joy to keep God's commandments. God's commandments are not designed to rob us of joy and of happiness, but to give us and provide us of that joy. As we have children, we come up with different rules that we want them to follow. Don't touch a hot stove. It's not that we hate our children and we don't want them to have the experience of touching the stove. It's because we care for them. Uh, and the understanding is that God does the same for us in that way. Then we get to the back, last part of the verses. We have the Bible still open. Verses 3 through 5, it says this. This is the love of God to obey His commands. His commands are not burdensome. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world even our faith to overcome the world, to conquer the world, to conquer your sin nature, to conquer your pride, to conquer your lusts. The words that are used here in the scripture as a reminder that this is not something that is actively done by the Christian. It's something that has already been done by Jesus. Jesus has already given us the victory by beating the devil through the cross and the sacrifice of his sins and the resurrection uh, of, of grace that we celebrate. And it's a reminder that Jesus has already overcome us, and so as he has, he passes that along to us. And sometimes we try to make life so hard. God, I can't. We try to make the excuses. Lord, I don't know how. Yeah, Jesus has already won. Jesus has already paid the price for your sins. Let him go. Jesus has already showed you the way you live. Follow him. Uh, Jesus has already given you victory uh, that you can find uh, this opportunity. To, what a great verse. For everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. Now the point of it isn't that we have such great faith. Because I know me. And I know. But my faith is based upon the faithfulness of Jesus. And I believe that God sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And as I keep that in my, the forefront of my mind, it reminds me that there's a lot of things in this world that can happen. There's a lot of things in this world that do happen. Now, some of them are devastating. Some of them are difficult. Some of them bring a lot of baggage to our life. But in the end, we're reminded Jesus has already won. My job is to keep putting my faith in the faithfulness of Jesus. He'll provide victory. Even this is what helps you overcome the world. Your faith. The ability to say, God, 
You're in control and not me. God, if I was God, I would do it this way, or I would do it. That doesn't matter. God has already done it. Your goal is to say, thank you, God. I don't understand, but help me worship you anyway. What helps you overcome? What gives you the opportunity to be a winner? Your faith. And it's not that your faith is great, but it's what you've placed your faith in. If your faith is in God, the creator of the universe, one who loves you and has established a family for you and has given uh, all kinds of promises for you, it doesn't matter sometimes how insignificant we are or how sometimes often we fail. But if our faith is there in God, he is always there to bring us back and give us the victory and make us the winner. Why is it so important for us to be overcomers? Why is it so important for us to be conquerors? And a couple books over, uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, let me just read for you what Jesus says. We did this study a few years ago. And at the end of every one of his letters to the churches that he writes, to Smyrna, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea, he has this phrase come around, to those who overcome. He says this, Jesus tells us in these chapters, to the one who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He says, to the one who overcomes, will not be hurt by the second death. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. To the one who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. I will give them the morning star. To the one who overcomes will be dressed in white. I will never blot out their name from the book of life, but will acknowledge their name before my father and his angels. To the one who overcomes, I will make a pillar uh, in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God. I will also write on them my new name. To the one who overcomes, Jesus says, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. We worship Jesus today because he overcomes and he helps us to overcome. The promises of God are deeper than what we even understand. What does it mean to have a new name written upon us? What does it mean to be a pillar in the temple of Almighty God in eternity? Uh, what does it mean to be dressed in pure white? We know the imagery that's there, but the reality of it when we get to have it will be such a blessing. The reminder is we're overcomers if we are faithful to Jesus. I think that's why Jesus told his disciples several times, take heart, I have overcame the world. A reminder that this world is not his home. Uh, that is, whatever they did to Jesus, and they did horrible things to Jesus, we're reminded as so we go through communion time every Sunday. But the good news is that you know, no matter what they did to Jesus, it was still part of God's plan because Jesus wins. Jesus beat the enemy. Jesus has his victory. And in the same way that he has his victory, he has promised that victory on to us. What does it take to be a winner? To have faith in God. You've got to have, be a part of the right family. You've got to have the right name uh, on, on your shirt. Uh, you got to make sure that you're connected uh, to the right people. And that right person is not me. That right person is only Jesus Christ. And to do that in faith, that means sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes we can't see what's over the next uh, mountain that seems to be uh, in front of us that we don't seem to be, ever be able to get around. Uh, maybe it's something in our physical life, and maybe it's something in our spiritual life, maybe it's something in our family life, and we're like, I don't know, God. I don't understand. I can't get there. But God's like, no, wait a minute. I can see what's on the other side. I've got a plan for you. Just stay faithful to me, and I will see you through. <laughs> to be a part of the family of God, to be born of God, it's a blessing. And we are reminded as we talked even a few <coughs> weeks ago, not everyone is a child of God. There are those who don't live in faith, who are outside of the promises and the blessings of God. But to you who have accepted Jesus in faith and have been obedient with, with him, he has provided all of these promises for heaven, eternity, peace, joy. I write these things, John says, 
so that you will know that you have eternal life. Trust God. He'll provide for you. We come to a time of our service. <coughs> Lord, we have a chance to respond. Lord, we have a chance to consider what Jesus has done for us uh, and lead our hearts in worship. And, and honestly, the first thing that we need to do is get right with the Lord. Uh, the opportunity to say, I've messed up. I need to repent of my sin. I need to challenge myself to walk faithfully. I need to let a few things go, God, and I really don't know how to do it. But maybe you can help me with it. And God says that he will. And maybe there's some of you who haven't been baptized. You're like, uh, I just, uh, I'm not sure. Jesus says you have to be reborn. You have to be born again of the water and of the spirit. Uh, that's a phrase that comes up in, even in the next couple of weeks here at the end of John chapter 5. The witnesses uh, that, John, uh, that Jesus stands up with. The waters of baptism are that example of living in faith and letting Jesus take you uh, and remake you uh, and putting his spirit in, in your heart. Maybe you need to make a decision for Jesus. I invite you to as we get to the chance to read Sunday. Come forward. Let's talk about it. Everyone comes from their own situation. And everyone has their own things that they have to deal with. I get it. Life is tough. But you're here with me. Good luck. We're here together. Let's walk this path in that way. If you need to respond to Jesus today, we're going to sing, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, 684. And if you need to respond to Jesus, come forward as we stand and sing the first verse, 684.
worthy. What a friend we have in Jesus. We'll do verses 1 and 3. So two times through, verses 1 and 3. What a friend we have in Jesus. 6.30.
to us. Lord, the opportunity to know you and to know your promises. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the people here. We thank you for the people who've been here in the past, uh, the foundation that we've been able to build our faith upon. And Lord, we ask that you help us to be faithful again to your call. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in our life. And help, Lord, Bethlehem Church, the Stecklin family, and the families who are represented here today and throughout this year uh, to be able to stand in your truth and be a witness of your great love in this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Great. Thanks for being here. Stand forward up here just for a moment. That way, at the end of the service, as we dismiss, the rest of them can come up and kind of give you a handshake. A couple announcements that we need to make besides the baptism uh, is next week I am going to be out of town. Uh, they invited me to go preach the homecoming at Clay City Christian Church. So I've got to do that, and uh, Chuck is going to be here uh, for uh, the service next week. So Chuck Belcher will be here uh, as your preacher. Uh, and ladies, we have their ladies' fellowship on Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock. That's what I want to make sure to uh, make sure you mark that on your calendar. 2 o'clock, Labor Day weekend, uh, and we'll get back with the last bit of First John uh, there at the end of September. Stay with me. Uh, let's uh, have a closing word of prayer. Uh, and be the Father God, as we have the opportunity to walk faithfully with you, for you, about you, thank you for being in us. And thank you, Lord, for your promises that cover us. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sin. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your spirit. And uh, Lord, thank you for providing us uh, a way and a desire uh, to follow after you. We ask a blessing upon your church today as they meet worldwide. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for those who are uh, in difficult places, standing up for truth. Uh, Lord, remind them that we have they have people who pray for them uh, continually, uh, that they can do your will. In the name of Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen.